بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد Welcome to the Friday حلقة at Abu Huraira Center in Toronto So we Ramadan is just around the corner and um, I've uh, been thinking about what to do and inshallah we are working on a series for Ramadan so we will have um, maybe three three meetings in, during uh, every week, three weekly meetings in Ramadan, in order to talk about something that would help us, inshallah, benefit from the month and uh, grow uh, religiously, spiritually, and draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, before Ramadan arrives, I thought uh, it's, it's probably good now to put um, our series on the uh, Quran, on the thematic uh, approach to the Quran on hold uh, till inshallah after Ramadan bi'ithnillahi ta'ala and I thought it's actually good and suitable now to talk about how we should get ourselves ready for Ramadan try to give some practical uh, tips inshallah ta'ala um, generally speaking the Prophet sallallahu and the companions would actually look forward to Ramadan we have in the authentic hadith the Prophet ﷺ before Ramadan, or just at the beginning of Ramadan, he said to the companions, he said, جَاءَكُمْ شَهْرُ رَمَضَانِ شَهْرٌ مُبَارَكٌ تُفَتَّحُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ الْجِنَانِ وَتُغْلَقُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ النِّيرَانِ So the Prophet ﷺ would approach the companions just prior to the beginning of Ramadan. He would say, Ramadan has come. Ramadan has arrived. It has come to you. It's a blessed month during which the gates of paradise are open, the gates of the hellfire are locked. So it seemed that it was obvious from this how the Prophet ﷺ was happy about the arrival of Ramadan. The same was the case with the companions. Actually, some scholars took from this hadith the permissibility of congratulations, uh, congratulating people at the beginning of Ramadan, saying, you know, saying anything. And there's no specific way to say that, uh, to congratulate, but just to express one's happiness. Uh, that uh, that we are witnessing the month of Ramadan. And obviously, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah uh, Yunus, قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Say, uh, with the blessings of Allah and His mercy, let them rejoice, let them find happiness. This is way better than you know all of the things people gather and collect and hoard. Uh, so, and again, we see the Prophet Sallallahu was the best, what was at his best in Ramadan. And we know that Jibreel would come down to the Prophet Sallallahu and study the Quran with him or review the Quran with him every Ramadan once. And the last Ramadan in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Jibreel came twice. And this shows that Ramadan is such a special time for good deeds and especially the deeds that really matter the most. Because the message of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is is the heart of it is the Qur'an. He, he, he was sent to convey the Qur'an and explain it. And Jibreel, towards the end of the life of the Prophet, he came in Ramadan to review the Qur'an twice with the Prophet ﷺ. And he chose Ramadan to do this. And it shows, you know, what importance is attached to Ramadan. And we know the, the famous narration from Anas ibn Malik anhu, where he said that the Prophet ﷺ was كَانَ أَجْوَدَ النَّاسِ Prophet was the most generous of all people. And the Prophet would be more generous even in Ramadan, during Ramadan. So it shows that it's time for the Muslim, for a believer to show their best, to do their best in Ramadan. That's the time. That's the time to you know, move on to the next level, to you know, raise the bar for for our performance, for our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is not possible without some kind of preparation and conditioning. And we don't want to fall into the trap that many people fall into, that they get excited at the beginning of Ramadan, then this fades away after the first week is, is passed and people reach a point of burnout. So it's better to prepare ourselves and not actually go there. So I'll share with you some tips that I believe could really help every one of us uh, benefit or maximize our benefit from Ramadan. So we have, uh, first and foremost, I would say repentance. 
And maybe many people don't take this seriously or they take it more as a ritual, as an empty ritual or some kind of lip service. But the reality is repentance, tawbah, is, has, has a real effect on the heart. Because what really stands between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our sins. What holds us back is our sins. What makes a bad and worship uh, burdensome and, and hard for us is our worship. Uh, sorry, is our sins. Because the sins are more like contamination. They compromise the health of our heart. And when the health is compromised, and when the health of the heart is compromised, you try to draw on your heart to do more acts of worship, you don't find energy. You don't find you find yourself depleted. And that's because again, the sins have taken away from the energy of the heart. They have con contaminated it, they have compromised its health and its stamina. So a very important thing to do is to actually start by cleaning ourselves, clearing our heart of any kind of contamination. And that's by repenting sincerely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And repenting is not a one event thing. It's not like a one instance kind of uh, act of worship. It's a constant and it's a beginning of a process. So, um, so in order to do repentance properly, I would recommend that you review your past year and look at your weaknesses, look at where you have stumbled, where you have fallen for your own weaknesses and mistakes and committed a sin against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Specifically, if you have committed a major sin or a big sin, this is what you have to deal with. This would be the, your biggest enemy in benefiting from Ramadan. So what you need to do is, you know, escape, break free from that, uh, from that enemy so that you will have the freedom, your heart will have the spiritual freedom to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you have made any major sin, you have committed any major sin or a big sin, it doesn't have one of, to be one of the major, but a really serious sin, I definitely uh, invite you to consider repenting to Allah. And repenting to Allah means you're giving Allah a covenant, a promise that I'm not going to do that again. But I really, in this moment, and I mean it, that I, 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 I'm, that I, I have the resolve, I'm determined not to go back to this anymore. And then you seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But sincerity of intention is, is, is of uppermost you know, importance here. Uh, and also another thing you want to repent from is your continuous sins, your recurring sins. Uh, there are sins that we commit regularly, that we come back every now and then, come, come back to every now and then. And these are the sins that, that got hold of you and, and they've become more of a habit. These are the ones you need to start repenting from. You need, you need to start seeking forgiveness for. And you need to start breaking from and trying to, again, break free from their grip because they are a very serious hindrance. So... And the way to go about this, I would definitely recommend you start with deep reflection. Many people do this mechanically and this, and unfortunately it doesn't really, um, doesn't produce its effect because it's not that real. It's not genuine. The level of sincerity is low and compromised. So you need to start with a lot of sincerity contemplation, reflection, deep reflection on your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your life and what it means. This is a very powerful place to begin your, your repentance or your tawbah from because that takes you deeper within, far from the sin, far from the, the, the captivating nature of the sin where your soul, your heart is free. And then your, your connection with Allah is bolstered, is heightened, and you connect to it. And from there, you make the covenant. And you see yourself free from the sin. And then you draw on Allah's help. You call upon Allah for help and for support. And uh, then you make a promise that no matter what, even when you, when you, even in moments of weakness, you promise Allah to hold on to his promise, to preserve it. And to observe the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's going to be challenging. But that's the sweetness of it, and that's the, of it. And that's the beauty of it. And that's what we are meant to do. And this is the real meaning of mujahada. 
striving against our own weaknesses. And since it's it's a specific time, you're talking about Ramadan, it, because it's it's a, it's a specific time frame, a specific time bracket, it makes it easier for you to commit. And then let the rest for, for inshallah for how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah is going to help you out in Ramadan. So starting with uh, repentance. Number two, I would say starting with more voluntary actions like fasting. Um, fasting, fast a little bit more, like fast one week, one day a week. In the, I mean, it's about, it's, it's less than two weeks till Ramadan. So what I would say fast at least once a week or twice a week uh, till Ramadan comes about. Um, and again, as, as a preparation, breaking from the pattern and from, you know, the pattern of just eating every day normally. It's just sort of, you're shaking your pattern, making it easy, inshallah, when Ramadan comes. But I, I don't recommend, if you're not someone who's used to to regular fasting, I don't recommend you, you, you fast like many days, like four or five days every week. It might be a little bit of, it might just, it might start drawing on your reserves and maybe you won't be able to sustain it in Ramadan. Um, so that, that's actually a good thing and I would say, say start with sadaqah many people keep their sadaqah for Ramadan and I understand because they want more rewards but look at it strategically when you give sadaqah it, it wipes away sins and that has an impact on your heart it has a cleansing effect and this will help you actually do better in Ramadan so it's it's a completely different type than you know giving sadaqah and expecting reward in Ramadan. It's just a completely different thing. Uh, so, so this is one, another one, which, uh, which is voluntary acts. I would say start with the Quran. A lot of the earlier generations, many of them would actually start the relationship. Oh, they would start intensifying their relationship with the Quran at the beginning of Shaban, which means a month before Ramadan. And that's a very good strategy. Again, because you don't want to overwhelm yourself uh, and make a huge change, just starting with Ramadan, uh, this might actually mean that you might not be able to sustain it. You reach a burnout because Ramadan will become a huge shift for you without any kind of conditioning or preparation. And then you cannot sustain it. So you'll start losing your energy. You start losing the excitement and the, the, the drive to do you know, more for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So start slowly, start a little bit. So, you know, some of the, in, in the last few days, these remaining days of Shaban, uh, start raising the bar a little bit higher in a way, consider it to be some kind of a warm up for, for Ramadan with some good deeds. Um, pray maybe two raka, even if it's just five minutes every night after Isha, after you pray your sunnah, Pray to Raka. Or if you are able to wake up before Fajr, because it's a very good idea in Ramadan to have the suhoor, the pre-dawn meal. So start, you know, getting used to waking up just before Fajr, where you are able to fit in, to squeeze in two Raka of Qiyam al layl It would be a beautiful thing. And it will definitely, you know, uh, get you warmed up for Ramadan. And uh, hopefully, inshallah, this will help you sustain, you know, your effort and your performance during Ramadan. Okay, so that's the second point that I want to share with you. Uh, a third good point, I would say, maybe draw on some social um, support. And maybe this might be a challenge this year because of the lockdowns in different countries and different places and the limitations. But still, I mean, we can do that, some of it online. Um, Alhamdulillah, in, in many of the places, as far as I know, in, in Canada, Alhamdulillah, we're able to have about uh, maybe 30% of uh, masjid's capacity, which is, it's good. It's definitely better than nothing. So we are able to have Salat al-Taraweeh at the masjid. And I would say if there is like a, some kind of a registration booking system, I would say, you know, rush to book your spots and make sure you are diligent with this so you don't miss out on the opportunity. Um, and um, and I might have another point to add on this, but let's leave it at that here with with uh, with the bookings. Um, 
so it, drawing on social benefit is basically if you, your friends, your circle of friends, uh, if you guys encourage each other and remind each other and, uh, uh, and um, I would say remind each other, we, you know, call each other to, to, to wake, your, wake up your friend before Fajr, tell him, hey man, you know, pray to Raka, for Raka, before, sorry, before Fajr. Uh, if you have one person call the whole group, something like this, uh, and uh, and maybe pray together at the masjid, and if it's safe, you know, opening your fast together, these are things that are actually uh, that are helpful. Having this kind of social support, the team spirit, is is a, is a huge boost for our performance in uh, Ramadan. And this is one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Salat al-Jama'ah like a, a big part of Islam that Muslims pray in congregation because it's, it's, it's a huge part along with other benefits but this is one part because we humans are social creatures and we get influenced a lot. We pick up the spirit of the group or the, the social entity and, and that's a good side. That's a, a very good side of this, of this phenomenon. So this is something that is good to do. And what I'd recommend as well is um, maybe you can start preparing something. Maybe you start, you can, that's number four, you can start shifting your daily routine. Uh, and I know with Ramadan, and alhamdulillah, this year in the Northern Hemisphere, it's not too bad for most, for most cities. Um, the, the days are not too long, like they were six or seven years ago or maybe five years ago again, in the middle of the summer, or when, when the days are the longest. Now it's a little bit more manageable. I think days around the Toronto area will probably be around 16 hours. Uh, towards the end of Ramadan, they might be 17 hours, which is alhamdulillah manageable. But I would say still, there will be a challenge on you getting enough sleep, because after Isha, you want to have Taraweeh, then you want to wake up before Fajr for Suhoor, or or better even for maybe more prayer. Uh, but again, it, and it means you, you might not have enough sleep or you might have interrupted sleep if you want to sleep. Some people have to sleep after Fajr so that they can manage because they have a, a job or they have other commitments. So I would say start working on shifting your patterns slowly, maybe from now. Start introducing some changes, not all the changes, but some changes. So it doesn't become a huge discomfort at the beginning of Ramadan to have many things changing at the same time. Um, and some of it might be putting in place some kind of system, uh, maybe shifting your work, your working hours, if you are able to do this. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, start working on some tasks that in advance so that you can, uh, you know, get them done before Ramadan comes in, or at least maybe you get some of them done so it lessens your work burden during Ramadan. Whatever kind of arrangement that in your capacity you are able to make in order to give yourself a bit more time, a bit more time to rest as well, and reduce the complexity of, you know, and the number of things like simplicity, resort to simplicity in Ramadan, this makes it way, way easier rather than having to manage too many things and too many variables at the same time. Um, yeah, so this is this kind of arrangement uh, as well. And, and I think parents as well will need to look at some kind of arrangement for arrangements for their kids. Um, maybe sleep times will start changing, shifting, uh, study hours, school hours, you know, homework, etc. You might want to start making an arrangement again there's no universal arrangement or one size fits all uh, you know just use common sense and wisdom inshallah ta'ala and this also leads us to number five uh, it's good if you are a parent to start you know uh, preparing your kids for ramadan and uh, again having if you if the kids are able to fast whether a full day or half a day or two-thirds of a day that's a good thing um uh, again, just be careful, be observant when it comes to their health and, um, and uh, that they're getting good nutrition at the time of iftar and maybe before fajr as well and that they are hydrated very well, especially at these times when there is, you know, the virus is around uh, and we know, you know, 
the immune system with fasting could get suppressed. But again, with hydration, proper hydration and a good meal after Maghrib and a good meal before Fajr, this inshallah uh, could um, again minimize the uh, any kind of impact on the immune system. But kids as well need to be prepared psychologically. They need the reminder. They, and they actually get excited about it. And I, I, I see this every year. The kids just look forward to Ramadan. They, they look forward to change. It's, it's a big change. And it's also beautiful. It's a fresh form of devotion. And it just somehow freshens up the whole concept of worship for the kids. So in this sense, it's very helpful. They look forward to it. And they also have a sense of achievement and accomplishment when they are able to fast. So that's very profound. But again, uh, be careful because some kids might not be able to have, and I'm speaking about younger kids, not the ones who are religiously accountable. Um, the younger kids, um, it's just training them, putting them in the spirit, make Ramadan a very beautiful time for them uh, as it should be. Um, and remember for us being kids, Ramadan was such a wonderful time. We looked forward to it because yeah, lifestyle changed, but again, there was a beautiful spirit for Ramadan. We felt it from our elders and it remained with us. So it's it's a wonderful way. It's a wonderful bonus in bringing up your kids and, uh, you know, again, strengthening their Muslim, emphasizing their Muslim identity, which is a very important thing to, to do. Um, in terms of preparation, something comes to mind. Um, Umar ibn Khattab anhu, was the first actually to put lights or torches or lanterns in the, mas the masjid in Ramadan. That was his way of preparing the masjid for Ramadan so that people could spend more time at night at the masjid. So he, he's the one who started this practice. And Ali ibn Abi Talib one day entered the masjid later on. After the time of Umar ibn Khattab, he entered the masjid. And he saw the masjid was lit with these, you know, torches and, uh, uh, and he said, like, he said, Rahimakallah, Ibn Khattab, may Allah have mercy on you, Ibn Khattab, may Allah uh, bring light to your grave as you have brought light to the houses of Allah, where people are able to pray and recite Quran and so on and so forth. So this was uh, Umar Ibn Khattab, it was uh, a huge step that he made where Masajid, People could stay in the masjid at night. They could they could recite. They could uh, uh, pray, stay longer, etc. More comfortably, you know, with the lights being there. Uh, so this was a, a preparation. Um, we said many of the early generations would actually there would be merchants. They would have a shop in the market in the marketplace, and they would actually actually close the shop for Shaban and Ramadan. Uh, again, not everyone can do that. We understand. So just you know use common sense and be wise about these things uh, imam malik rahimahullah ta'ala when ramadan started he would close all of his classes and he would say this is the time this is the month of the quran he was just read read the quran and contemplate um imam shafi rahimahullah ta'ala would read the quran so many times in 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 the month of ramadan so we can, we can see that this it was like it's it's a very special season and it was a very special time. And these were people who appreciated and understood the value of Ramadan. And they were not willing to sacrifice that or waste it at all. And we should be mindful of this. And I believe, alhamdulillah, many of the practicing Muslims, I see this, they actually take Ramadan seriously. They look, they look forward to it. And that's a very good sign, alhamdulillah. It's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah to maintain that, keep it, and even... Uh, make it grow, make more Muslims, you know, wake up to the beauty of Ramadan and help them utilize it and benefit uh, from it. And we know from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that benefiting in Ramadan is just so easy that even the Prophet ﷺ, when Jibreel came to him and he made dua and he said, anyone who witnesses the month of Ramadan and this person doesn't get his or her sins forgiven, may Allah distance them from their mercy. May they be taken away from the mercy of Allah. Why? Because it's so easy. It's so easy that someone who's not paying attention completely, who's indifferent completely to Ramadan, will actually miss out on Ramadan. Or someone who doesn't care about Ramadan, which is, shouldn't be the case for someone who really looks forward to meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and returning to him. Uh, some of the things as well that we can do in, in, 
in order to prepare ourselves for Ramadan, uh, I would say, although we spoke about arrangements, but um, social media, because it's this is just a different type of, of arrangement. Uh, you know, observation and research shows that social media takes a huge chunk of the average person's time, up to five, six hours a day. And that's a lot. Uh, this time could be utilized. It could be utilized. So what I would say, use it as a means to, uh, for example, learn something about Ramadan or get yourself motivated. Or as we said, with a social support circle, maybe that's it. But other than that, I recommend you put your social media on hold. Really, I recommend you sort of fast, do some you know, uh, phone fasting if that's possible. I definitely think Ramadan is a good time for this, or at least social media uh, fasting. So I think you can sign out of your accounts. You don't have, or you put them on hold, you freeze them, whatever. Um, I would recommend this. And if you uh, are looking forward to social support, etc., whatever, just choose one of the applications or one of the those social media platforms that doesn't distract you specifically for let's say for specific kind of messages or reminders or groups etc where you don't get this all of these messages and notifications i definitely recommend you do this and um, usually people when they seek some kind of benefit etc usually people will, would watch a video so they would go to youtube and they would watch a video um, but again don't keep and i think uh, youtube uh, allows you some kind of uh, a mechanism to limit your time. So it gives you a reminder, right? You put a time limit and I would recommend you do this. So whatever measures you can take with social media, because it's a huge challenge and it's, it's, it's a very subtle distraction. Most people don't realize how much time they put in social media and how much time they waste. So I recommend you take all the necessary measures uh, in order to, uh, again uh, not get trapped and then social media or distracted by it and then you will see that you have a lot of time a lot of time that usually goes waste uh, on social media so that's an important arrangement as well inshallah to do and i say start doing it from now or maybe in the next few days um and don't wait until the beginning of ramadan because once ramadan starts so many things are changing so many things are shifting and it just becomes uh, you know a burden to have one more shift there so do it from now or do it in the next few days before ramadan so that you enter ramadan without having to change too many things at once so this would be my uh, recommendation um i would i, I want to give a special recommendation for Ram for the quran um put a plan for yourself in the Quran, those who already have a good relationship with the Quran, who read the Quran, who have uh, like they enjoy re reading the Quran, I would say put a plan to recite the Quran maybe once, twice, or three times at least. If you are able to, you know, most of us have the time, but it's just a matter of, of time management here or uh, putting some kind of a plan. Uh, if you devise a good plan, inshallah, uh, a lot of people found it easy to you know, have a specific portion to read before and after every salah. So before the salah, they would read a page, let's say, and after salah, they would read a page, for example, or two pages before and two pages after salah. So, and, and if you do this, uh, that means with every salah you're reciting or you're reading four pages, five salah every day, that's 20 pages at juz. And, and it doesn't take that much time because it's spread uh, out throughout the day. Um, for some people, they might they, they love to read in big chunks. So maybe at the beginning of the day, read for one or two hours. So whatever works for you, I would definitely recommend you start putting the plan and working on it. Um, for some people, it might not be the recitation, maybe listening. And it's good to actually put a plan together and utilize whatever comes 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 uh, comes easy in your in your in your practice or in your approach. Uh, some people love to read maybe some kind of explanation 
a commentary on the Quran. Fine, if if you don't, if you're unable to sustain recitation of the Quran or listening to the Quran, and you find that you get motivated reading tafsir, okay, fine, do it. If this is the open door for you, whatever door is open for you, utilize it and benefit from it. And wherever you find more joy is 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 more likely to be the, the, the area where you are able to sustain. So I would say do more of that. Utilize it, benefit from it, take advantage of it. What else uh, we can say in order to try to benefit from Ramadan? Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to make this long. It's just uh, because sometimes just mentioning too many tips might make us, you know, forget about them and not utilize them. So I, I wanted to emphasize the most, the ones that I see to be the most, um, the most important. Um, one final thing I would say, and this is towards when Ramadan really starts, make your relationship with Allah more personal. And I, inshallah, I'll probably expound on this, inshallah, when we get closer to Ramadan or when we meet during Ramadan, bi uh, ta'ala. So I think it's a good now, it's about half an hour, so it's a good time to close. And uh, I hope this serves as a good reminder. And uh, I hope you find some of the tips helpful there and that they would help you, inshallah, benefit from Ramadan and utilize it and get more reward, get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, we'll meet you once before Ramadan and uh, we will meet, uh, if Allah allows, inshallah, we will meet you three times a week in Ramadan ta'ala, and discuss something, talk about something that inshallah should help us. Uh, benefit more and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan for joining us uh, and wish you all a great Ramadan, a Ramadan that is full of blessings and forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The final thing we say, Allahumma salli wa sallam, Ashina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika, shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu alayku, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.